Right, we're going to start with a disclaimer. Right. There's going to be loads of spoilers in this. This isn't a podcast episode. Luke is uh, Darth Vader's son. Well, people weren't ready. They, they weren't. <laughs> the, my second disclaimer, you've already ruined. My second disclaimer was going to be, if you're expecting us to clowning around like on a normal podcast, that's not this. This is us being professional. Um, we've got an agenda and everything. This it's is blank for the looks of that. This is a story meeting. There you go. There's an agenda. You can just about see yeah, it on there. Yeah, there we go. This is a story meeting for our business, Kestevan Media, mm. um, and we're going to be talking about some of the upcoming projects that we've got. So, warning again, spoilers ahead. Um, we're going to be talking about storylines for upcoming fiction projects, um, Stray, Left Behind Rewrite, some other ideas that we've got as well. So if you don't want to know what goes on in those books, don't watch this, don't listen to this. Still give just, it a thumbs up though. Yeah, just stay away from this because it's full of spoilers. Just wait for the books to come out. Is that enough time for people to turn off? Can't say fairer than that. Excellent. Well, those of you who are listening to this on the Indie Publishing Adventure feed, hello, welcome back to you. Um, we haven't done an Indie Publishing Adventure episode since last year. It has been a long time, hasn't it? We don't know if these are going to be a regular thing again or not, but we needed a story meeting um, because we haven't had one for ages. And we thought, if we're going to be talking to each other, we may as well record it because we don't the only other way we communicate apart from when we've got a microphone in front of us is via text message or email because I can't stand his ridiculous voice. Yeah, I'm not even looking at him right now. Right, exactly. So, into the story meeting. Go on then. We have a number of projects on the horizon. We actually said a week ago when we decided we were going to have this story meeting it was going to be about the rewrites that we were going to be doing to the fiction projects that we brought out last year, Mature and Left Behind. That's all gone a little bit wrong for me we're going to start with what i've been spending the last week doing and um, because i spent two days of my half term last week trying to assemble the characters that we got set up for mature into something that resembled a proper story <laughs> and i love the characters they're fantastic but it's really hard to come up with an actual story to tell to come up with some proper plot for them because they kind of just pop around do what they want We've both read a book recently called Take Off Your Pants by Libby Hawker, um, and it's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, we've, used, we've both been using that to plot out the books that we've been, um, we've been looking at. And um, it's really hard to put that structure into what we had set up for Mature without completely throwing out everything we already had, which I don't really want to do. So that one needs a bit more time to mull over. And it's mainly because the very first, well, the f two first things you need to come up with, you need to come up with a flaw for your major character. And I had loads of them for David and Mature. Mm. Um, but also you have to work out what he wants. Yeah, that's the trouble I had uh, thinking about all of the books that we've looked at. Um, I had started another project that I, I just hadn't written in ages. And I thought, oh, what an opportunity to get back into that. And then when I couldn't think of like a, a flaw or a need, I just thought, what, <laughs> what am I writing this for? Um, whereas Left Behind, I could think of plenty of flaws and a driving force behind it all. Um, you know, it's quite clear that their driving force is to survive, you know. Um, but with Mature, the driving force yeah. is kind of to rebuild his shattered life, isn't it? Well, his life isn't shattered, though, at the start. And that's the problem. At the start, he's going to university because he wants to get a degree. That's what he wants. But that's yeah. not really much of a... Yeah, he's had a rough couple of years, but he wants to get a degree because he wants to get back into a high-paid job because he wants to sort his life out put his marriage back together maybe See, by his standards his life has kind yeah. of fallen apart but it's what not... kind of man would go from a well-paid job to slamming it at university i mean exactly. both of us but um but it's surely, not yeah. a particularly interesting story and no it's not enough of a it's not something where the list the reader goes oh yeah he really needs to hurry up with this like they're not suddenly hooked in by his dramatic yeah exactly so oh. what i've done is i've gone back to the thing that i wrote the first twenty thousand words of at the start of the year Anyone who was watching my Write a Novel in 100 Days series on YouTube <laughs> earlier in the year, I got, got about 15, 20 days in, um, and it was going really well. And it's Stray, and Stray, we've never talked about anything before, and I've never actually told you the story for Stray, so this is going to be... I kind of read a bit of it on your well, thing you did. Yeah, you've read the first four or five chapters. Well, I've read the first chapter. <laughs> okay, you've seen... No, I followed it for a the bit. The first four or five chapters have been on Wattpad. I've now taken them off because I need a bit of a rewrite to fit in with the new structure as well. But Stray is... a uh, young adult novel and we've never written anything young adult before if i understand it right they've all been living in a kind of post-apocalyptic village where no one's allowed outside because it's deadly and then they go outside and travel the world 
pretty much. Is that right? Mm, sort of. Um, basically, um, to give you the background for how Stray works, um, it's the story of a 16-year-old girl called Leona Northam um, who lives in New London. And New London is what's... It's the world being rebuilt after 99.9% of the world's population were wiped out in a plague of some kind in 2015. It's set 25 years in the future, so it's set in 2040. So, so the owner has ever known, has only ever known life after the whole world went wrong. Um, I came up with this idea whilst Ebola was in the news <laughs> uh, at the tail end of last year. I thought, I wonder what would happen if everybody died. Um, and that's where this came from. So we pick up the story with Leona, um, pot- pottering around, 16-year-old girl. Um, she goes to school and she lives in the walled city, maybe, of New London, um, which basically comp- I looked up I actually did some research for this how where, what the future no I looked <laughs> at the past right there was a wall around London which is the old wall that was old London and it basically comprises everything from Tower Bridge out roughly as far as sort of Liverpool Street Station mm. um, goes over as far as um, somewhere over there that I can't remember but there's you can see bits of the wall that are left over and I thought well They'd perhaps rebuild. They'd yeah. rebuild that wall. So I've got maps and everything that I've not got with me. I could hold them up. I've got drawings, mm-hmm. but we'll save them for another week. And um, but she's lived her whole life um, in this city, um, and I'm going to read through my story beats. Go on, because um, I've spent the weekend plotting this out, um, and I now have my full 16 chapter story. So this might be a little bit dry, but you know, it's a story meeting. We're not here to entertain yet buy it when it's out um, but this is me <laughs> telling him this story for the first time because no one knows anything past chapter five chapter five of this my daughter loves the first five chapters cool but well, i've never well. i've never revealed the rest of the book to anyone else ever so chapter one and these are a bit iffy they're not written as a story yet no, so of course. bear with me so chapter one um leona is down in an abandoned underground station with her childhood friend connor um, they, um we give a bit of background about what's happened the stuff i've just said to you um, and start to question, is it dangerous beyond the wall? Because obviously there was this disease that wiped everyone out, and the whole reason the wall has been put up um, is because it's not safe out there. You could catch it if the, the disease isn't within the wall because they built the wall up. Anyone who had the disease got thrown out, and the only people who got to live in the inside the wall are the people who didn't have it. Um, so they're exploring this abandoned underground station. They go down a little bit deeper. Um, Leona's interested in what's going on, a bit scared by it all. Um, they have a bit of an explore, but then have to rush off because she realises she realizes she's late to pick up her little sister Ruby from school. And that's the end of chapter one. Now she has to pick up Ruby because mum's at work and dad died five years before. And we don't know why. <laughs> uh, so chapter two, and um, we get a bit more background on Leona and Ruby's lives and their relationship while Leona cooks Ruby some dinner. Um, while she's cooking dinner and they're having a bit of a chat, um, Connor bursts in warning them, Something bad's going to happen. He doesn't know what, but his dad's coming over. His dad is a warden, um, and the wardens are the folk who police New London. Um, and eventually, Warden Brisker, Connor's dad, comes in and says, Leona's mother has died. Um, obviously, bad news, very sad, cry, cry. Um, and Leona and Ruby have to go off and spend the night with Connor's family. Chapter three. Um, chapter three, um, we find out that because of the rules of New London... Um, Leona and Ruby aren't allowed to keep their house although Leona's 16 um, housing demand is so great inside New London that there's no adult there there's no one contributing to society in there so they can't keep the house so they're going to have to be split up Leona's going to be sent to take over her mum's old job in the factory that she was working in and we'll find out later where she's going to live and Ruby is going to be going into care children's home, care, something like that that's one of the areas I'm a bit iffy on at the moment and it'll become clear why I'm a bit iffy on that in a little while um, and in this chapter as well, it's young adult. We have to weave in a little bit of potential romance mm. between Leona and Connor there, because obviously 16-year-old girls do like the idea of snuggling up to a muscly 17-year-old boy. You've seen Hunger Games. You know, you know Divergent. That's what happens in these books. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's chapter three. Chapter four, um, Leona is off to work in the factory for the first time. It's horrific. Um, she meets a girl called Molly, Um, and Molly basically helps her through the day. The whole way through these early chapters, we're really playing on the fact that Leona is useless. She's scared. Um, She's relied on her mum. She's relied on Connor. She's now relying on Molly. 
Um, she's met outside work by Ward- Warden Briscoe, who takes her off to her new home, which is a miserable old tower block. Um, she's got a tiny one room in there, shared bathroom, shared to- um, shared kitchen. Um, but Molly also lives there because her parents died a couple of years before as well. So M- Molly's like a year or two older than the owner is. Um, so they have a little bit of a getting to know each other pally session. Hmm. Chapter five. A few days pass. Um, Leona still hasn't heard anything about Ruby. She doesn't know where she is. She hasn't been able to... I'm allowed to play some more video games. Excellent. That's my video game alarm. Um, Leona hasn't heard anything else from Ruby. Um, she's not allowed to go and visit. She doesn't even know where she is. So her and Molly go off to the Citizen Centre. Whilst at the Citizen Centre, a big argument between Leona and the, the nerd behind the glass <laughs> goes off. And basically... Um, the end result of that is they've got no record that Ruby exists. Um, they don't believe that she doesn't exist. Leona doesn't have a sister. Leona goes mental, storms out the citizen centre, off to go and find Connor's dad. Because he's the only one who can in power who can verify that Ruby ever existed. Yeah. So next chapter, we're off to um, Molly and Leona are rushing off to Connor's house. Um, and Leona challenges Connor's dad. Um he basically says, there's nothing we can do. It's out of my hands. You really need to drop it because there's dangerous stuff. You're risking your life, our lives. We, You've just got to drop this. This is the way things are. You're an adult now. She's a child. You've just got to go and get on with your life. You have to contribute. That's just the way things are. You really have to drop it. Obviously, Leona kicks off even more. She needs a sister. And while this, all this is going on, Warden Briscoe's radio goes off. Um, in, and An instruction comes out that, they're on the lookout for Leona and Molly. This has gone out to all the wardens. They need to find him. They're considered dangerous. And he basically says, look, get out now. If you don't leave right now, I'm going to have to arrest you. You've just got to get out. And they flee with Connor, who's helping them, um, and basically helps them try and get away and find somewhere to hide. Which brings us into Chapter 7. We're nearly... So far, this is, you know, I'm quite impressed with this. This isn't how I remember it. You've changed this quite a bit, haven't you? I have changed it quite a bit. Um, I remember it going straight into kind of, we're outside, let's go for a wander sort of thing. Um, a bit on what pad never got. They never got outside. Oh, they? Right. they talked about it. Oh, they talked. Yeah, there. they talked about. It. Yeah, he's. That's it. He works on the. He works on the underground. That's why he knows uh, his way around. Yeah. That's actually quite important. He works on the underground, which it doesn't work as train stations or anything anymore. But it is how they get stuff in and out of the city. He's involved in that, so he has an underground map, which is like gold dust. No one has these anymore. Um, so he knows his way around a little bit. So he sort of has been close to being outside. He's not been properly outside, but he knows what's going on in the outside world. Well, you know, there's nothing there. He sounded a bit like he was bragging about it when I was reading it. He's a braggadocious <laughs> whippersnapper. He's trying to impress the pretty yeah, lady. Yeah, I was going to say, he does sound like he's been over-emphasising his... Yeah, exactly. Uh... Um, so, into Chapter 8. Um, they have nowhere to go. They can't go back to the um, the flats that they're living in because, obviously, they know who they are. They left their names at the Citizen Centre. They've got to go. The only place they can go back down into the underground tunnels connor has a map um and tells them how to get out of the city there's an unused um line that goes all the way out from liverpool street all the way up to high barnet you can tell i have actually done my research which isn't used anymore um so connor basically takes them to the station gives her the map he can't go with them because if he goes then his family they're in danger as well he it can't be seen that he helped them escape so he does as much as getting her to the tube station giving her the map and saying follow this line keep going you will eventually get beyond the wall and get out. As they're going along this disused track, they go past King's Cross Station, about an hour in, and they see something neither of them have ever seen before. There's a train, and it's turned on, and it's moving. They've never seen a moving train before. What's Mm. all this? But there's loads of wardens around anywhere. They're close to getting spotted, so they just have to leg it back up the underground line again. Um... Once they get out of there, um, where are we? I've lost myself now. They do eventually get up as high as High high Barnet, get out of that station, and it is exactly the way it's always been described to everyone within New London. It is your typical post-apocalyptic, ravaged by looters wasteland. Um, There's no signs of life. There's nothing around. It's just how you would expect the outskirts of London to look if they'd just been left to rot for 25 years after having been massively looted by rioting nutcases. You haven't been to the Emirates Stadium, then... (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It should be easy to picture. Mm -hmm. Um, Chapter 9 is basically the story of Leona and Molly trying to survive outside by themselves. Neither of them have any survival skills. There's no food out there. They can't even find clean water. Um, So they're drinking out of a dirty river. Um, (laughs) 
eating any scraps of anything they can find, like leaves and mud and whatever else they might be eating. And after three or four days of that, understandably, they're dehydrated, they're starving hungry, they're exhausted, and, you know, they don't know what to do. They want to go and get Ruby back, but how can they? They're two teenage girls who've never survived outside on their own, they're exhausted, and they're pretty close to just thinking, you know what, should we just curl up in a corner and die? Chapter 10. They've slept in some kind of shelter overnight. Leona wakes up. Molly's only gone. She's not there. <laughs> Leona's now by herself. Charging around, trying to find her. Obviously can't. She's completely on her own now. No idea what to do. All she can think of is she wants Ruby back. She wants Molly back. She wants to see Connor. She just wants to go home, but home doesn't exist anymore. Um, and in the end, she does just give up. She goes back to the underground station, finds a corner, and just lies down to die slash sleep. Um... But while she's lying there, she gets attacked by a group of bandits. Um, And these bandits, it turns out, make a living. They live outside the wall, but they make a living by capturing escapees and selling them back to the new London government as slaves. Mm -hmm. So they've captured her. They've locked her up in a cage um, and they're trying to get her back to health. So they're feeding her. They're giving her water. They're letting her rest up because they'll get more stuff like clothes and food and stuff for it if she's not at death's door so they spend a few days feeding her up as this is happening um one of the bandits tom spends more and more time chatting to leona he's a interest no he's Mm. in his mid-40s right um turns out that 10 or so years before he had a daughter around about leona's age Uh, um so (laughs) 16 year old daughter she died there's hints that the government might have been involved in her death um, we don't actually find out what happens. I'm still not entirely sure how Tom's daughter died. Um, which his, will... his daughter, not Leona. No, because she would be 26 now. We should have... Oh, right, when she... Yeah, see. 10 years ago. She Sorry. Was... So you. Tom sees a lot of his daughter in Leona, um, so gets a bit of a soft spot for her. Um, Leona starts to build up this bond with Tom, um, and they spend a chapter bonding and getting to know each other. Um, chapter 12, um, the owner and Tom's relation, relationship is getting stronger. The du- and the day comes when the bandits are going to take her back into New London to sell her back as slaves. And instead, Tom kills the other two bandits and frees the owner. Because it's just like it's my daughter. <laughs> um, chapter 13, um, the owner and Tom are now trying to survive together on the outside world. Obviously, Tom's been doing it for 10 years since he left New London himself. He knows the way of the wasteland. Um, but has absolutely no interest in going back into New London and rescuing Ruby or Molly, assuming that's where she is. Um, because he, he's he been dealing with the government. He knows that, you know, they're nasty. They're, they want her as a slave. If they go back, they're both going to get arrested or killed. He's absolutely no interest in it at all. Um, and they spend a few days falling out with each other and, just she wants to go back, he won't go back, she can't go back without him, she's stuck again. In the end, big huff, she storms back off to the to, to the High Barnet tube station. And would you believe Connor is stumbling out of it, bloodied up, as she gets back to the tube station? Um, which leads us into chapter 14. Um, I have got a note that we're going to come back to there in a minute, where potentially I stick in an extra chapter there of Leona and Connor getting a bit snuggly again, just to, again, build on the fact that they love each other, but they don't mm-hmm. know it yet. Um, so chapter 14, um, Tom still has absolutely no interest in going back. Um, Connor's parents have been killed. That's why he's escaping because it became obvious that they'd all had a hand in helping the owner of Molly escape. So, uh, Connor's parents were killed. Connor himself barely managed to escape and only managed to get out because he knew his way around the tunnels and the wardens didn't. Um, but he is now upping that urgency of we really need to go and get Ruby back because if she's not dead now, she's going to be dead soon. These are really bad people. We need to go and rescue her and get as far away from here as possible. Tom is basically saying, yeah, that's all all right. But forget the kid. She's probably already dead. Let's leg it anyway. You two are hot now. We can't, mm-hmm. I can't be seen to be with you unless I'm bringing you back in chains. We need to get as far away as possible. Let's go and live out our days in Chelmsford. Or wherever they might Who go. Who wouldn't want to live there? Exactly. Um, which brings us on to chapter 15. We're now, we're getting towards the end now. Tension's starting to rise. Um, 
Leona is just about agreeing to... Tom's probably got a point. We, If we go back, we're going to die. She's probably already dead. There's, I don't know what I can do. I'm stuck. Connor takes her to one side. Look, you, that is your sister. She is the only family you've got. You're the only family she's got. We go back. We try and save her. If we die doing it, at least we tried. If you go and live the rest of your life not even trying, how are you even going to be able to live with yourself? Don't be such a monster. We're going back. Connor and Leona get themselves ready to go back. And Tom, eventually, realising that there's going to be no way to talk them out of it, and again, having his soft spot for Leona, because she's like his daughter, um, reluctantly agrees to go with them, but on the understanding that if everything does go wrong, he's going to pretend he captured them and just sell them anyway, because (laughs) all he cares about is himself. Yeah, exactly. And he makes it clear to them that he's going, he'll help as much as he can, but he's not going to get himself killed for it. Um. Chapter 16, they make it back through the abandoned tunnel in New London. This is where I need your help. This is where it starts to get a little bit iffy. Um, Because there's a couple of potential options. Firstly, they pass back through King's Cross. This time it's completely deserted and there's no signs at all that anyone's been there. Um, Tom and Connor start to question whether Leona really saw what she says she saw. Um, But then maybe they find something, perhaps Ruby's teddy bear, perhaps, I don't know, something that links back to the fact that Ruby was probably here. So that's one option here. The other option is they just pass straight through King's Cross altogether and make a beeline for a children's home. But the reason I'm not really comfortable with the children's home angle is because if there's a children's home, why didn't she just go there before she (laughs) she left it? Um, So that was originally how it was going to be. It was going to be a children's home. But now I'm thinking it might be something at King's Cross. Um, You'd need something early on to suggest that... Yeah, we can. If, if Ruby's got something that she's attached to that obviously means Ruby, we can sew that back in early on in that chapter two where Leona and Ruby are having their pally getting to know each other, well, showing off their relationship to the yeah. reader thing. But also the fact that I didn't think when you were talking about King's Cross that all the kids were there or anything like that. So there'd need to be something there that not necessarily suggested it. But... Well, if we've got wardens buzzing around and trains no, I suppose, moving... suppose, yeah. And... It, that will become clear in two chapters time as well why potentially that all does link together from earlier on king's cross is always got a it's always relevant but we don't know why yeah, it's relevant. It's just in the background. That's, yeah. yeah that's why there were people there earlier because it becomes relevant right at the end of the book um but yeah i'm thinking this this showdown now might happen at king's cross because they find something that suggests ruby was there Makes and they sense. dig a little bit deeper and then they get to some holding area type thing or something, whatever they are, the captain of the wardens, Captain Rowland, is there. He's got a couple of wardens helping guard him. Um, this could either be at King's Cross or it could be at a children's home or it could be somewhere else. I'm not sure where this takes place yet. Um, but basically, Tom kills the two wardens who are with Rowland um, and they take Captain Rowland prisoner um, and basically force him into explaining what's going on. He refuses to do it. Um, but they eventually make it into this control room type thing, which again, I don't know whether it's at the citizen centre, it might be at the control at the King's Cross, it might be at a children's home, but he eventually reluctantly gets dragged along with them to a, a control room. And in this control room, there's just a wall of monitors. The mm. monitors have got labels on them with names of different cities. And on one of these monitors is Ruby hooked up to a life support machine, all the normal stuff. And it just says Cambridge under it. And on another one, perhaps in a different city, I've got Bristol here, but it could be anywhere. Molly's on another one again, life support machine hooked up to cables and stuff. She's in a different city. Um, Roland won't tell them why they're there. He won't tell them what's going on. Um, and basically says, look, they they realise they've got to go off to one of these. They've got to go to Cambridge to rescue would you, Ruby. Would you want it to be that far? Or would you not want it to be like other ends of london so you keep it all kind of in the confines of the underground so that it's feasible they because cambridge cambridge and bristol we've basically written molly out there not necessarily it's a five book series yeah they, I suppose. Uh, eventually they're going to make their way around the whole country and realize that new, <laughs> no, a tour. no i get what you mean well, but... new london isn't yeah. all it was cracked up to be it's not all that's left everything is left there are these pockets of yeah. government yeah, all over the country over. they're all interlinked but none of them know the other ones exist. Mm. Um, and there's something going on with these life support machines hooked up. What are they doing to the people they take, they, they capture? Yeah. Um, but Captain Rowland won't tell them any of this. Um, they decide they've got to go to Cambridge. They don't know what to do with Captain Rowland. He basically says something along the lines of, well, there's, there's really no point in you doing that anyway. The moment you leave London, 
I'm going to have you killed. We'll have someone come after you. The moment you get there, you'll be killed there. Um, and then this is where Leona has her coming of age moment. Mm. She's got one of the guns that was taken off one of the killed bandits and just shoots Captain Ronan in the face. Says something along the lines of, they won't even know we're coming. Because she's now, ugh, she's, a, <laughs> she's a badass now. Cool. Um, they hide his body off in a tunnel somewhere. Agree they've got to go after Cambridge. They have no idea how they're going to get there. They have no idea what they're going to find when they get there. Um, and it ends with them, I don't know, stealing a car. Um, there'll be abandoned cars around, probably still with petrol in, um, or even just deciding to walk up there. It's not beyond the realms of possibility to walk to Cambridge from London mm-hmm. in a day or two. Um, and it ends with them off to Cambridge for the next step of the story. <laughs> exactly! <laughs> They're strays! Um, yeah, I think the only thing there that makes me think, the only part of that whole thing that made me sort of go, Ugh, was the uh, finding the bear... I would suggest maybe having just a generic kid thing that isn't hers, but makes them think, wait a minute, there's a kid thing here. Be. Just because if it's her exact bear. Yeah, well, I don't... It, do you know what I mean? All the I'm bear thinking, was... I haven't yeah. actually got bear written no, in the notes No, but you get what anyway. I mean. Like, just, there's, it has to be a something that makes her think, was Ruby here? Because yeah. otherwise, they're on this suicide mission to go and rescue well, Leona's yeah, exactly. little sister. Like, if it's just... There have been people here. Well, Leona knows there were people here. Yeah. She saw them. So it has to be. to be. It has to be. The children here. It has to be. Ruby's here. Mm. Let's forget we're not going back into New London anymore. We're still an hour away. Ruby is here. Let's explore here and find out where she is. So there has to, if it if the whole showdown thing happens at King's Cross, there has to be something to tie Ruby yeah, specifically to make them think, in there. Well, couldn't does it have to be specifically her and not just she gets a hunch she's there. Why would she stop? She's if there's like kids, some some sort of inkling that kids have been taken through. But there. we don't know kids are being taken. Mm. At, at the moment, we don't find out other kids are being taken until we get into the control room and we see this wall of monitors and see there's dozens of them. I just at think this it's stage, a bit Ruby's to think that only Ruby's item would, or some sort of hint to Ruby specifically above it all can other. Be a, it can be a more subtle hint. We, I don't know. Yeah, it could that's be, the only part. I think the rest of it we can was tie, quite impressive. We can, I, I quite enjoyed that. We can tie in something quite subtle. I've got a couple of notes here for myself, um, which were things I wanted to question. We've got the note, because um, originally that whole showdown happened at a children's home, um, and I've said the children's home isn't mentioned at all until that last act. Um, do you want to make enough Sorry. noise kicking around oh, on the floor? What are you doing? Avoid all the rubbish. Is well, stop moving your feet. That'll avoid it. Um, so... It can't. I've already rolled out the children's home in my mind since I've done these notes, but they could be heading back to the Citizen Centre. That showdown could happen there if we can't find a way to make it King's Cross that seems feasible. They could just make a beeline to the Citizen Centre and that's guarded by the captain and the control room is there, which that might be a more feasible place for the control room to be in this big guarded government building anyway. The only problem with that is if it's a big guarded government building, there's likely to be a stronger warden presence there mm. that one 45-year-old bloke who doesn't really want to get his hands dirty mm-hmm. and a couple of kids aren't going to be able to overpower. It needs to be somewhere that there's only going to be a few people guarding. Which Could they be coming through and another train goes by full of people, like, chained up? And they just assume that prisoners get taken away that way. Uh, Not Ruby or anyone like that, just randoms that they don't, don't recognise. I like the whole conflict between them of, yeah, you were making it up, you're in that case... Yeah, well, they can still have that, and then they can have the train come through full of people. But, like, shit. but then it's full of people. How do they have this little showdown three on three if there's loads well, of Well, that's gone. There? So they head to the station to find out what the hell's going on. I don't know. Mm. My other note is, um, do the government know about the High Barnet Station and the abandoned track that leads all the way up there? And the reason I've questioned that is because if they don't, how do they think the bandits are getting back into the city to sell the mm. slaves? So we've got this whole... And the story hinges on this station being something that only Connor knows about. Because otherwise, they'd have walked straight up that line when Leona and Molly Molly escaped, and they'd have followed Connor straight up that line. So, if they know about it, how do they both get away without being caught? There's nothing wrong with them all knowing about it. It just makes it harder to get through. If they know that's how the bandits are getting in, surely they can, by a process of logic, think that's perhaps how they're getting out. Yeah, so, but if they think that, it doesn't really matter. They'll just assume that the bandits will probably massacre them or send them back. Do you know what I mean? There's no, there's nothing to lose in people running down there on their own if there's bandits at the other end <laughs> waiting to catch them and bring them back. I thought you'd kind of already established that, you know, the bandits are there yeah. to be their little net. Yeah, if they survive so, yeah. and get away, who the hell cares? <laughs> exactly. So, 
all we really need to work out is what we do about that ending, where it happens. <clears throat> I like the ending. Yeah, I, just, I, the whole I thing need it just... to be more logical with a location of where it's happening. How, what makes them? There's two. There's a few things about the ending. Firstly, the head of the whole wardens is there because he's the only one who knows about this control. Room. I mean, that's feasible. He would be in the control room because he's in charge. Warden Briscoe, Connor's dad, he doesn't know about the control room. He doesn't yeah. know what's going on. Because if he'd have known, he'd have got Leona and Ruby away the moment their mum died. Yeah, because he's a nice guy. Probably stood up to it. Cause yeah, he's... exactly. So it's realistic that Captain Rowland is going to be wherever the control room is, but it also needs to be realistic that, A, there's only a couple of guards there and it's not mm. swarming with them, and also, bearing in mind our group of heroes don't know about it, it has to be somewhere they've decided to make a beeline for for a logical reason. Yeah, but the reason I just thought, like, if they're arguing about it and then something happens, like like I was saying about the train going through, um, they could always have it that you know, any guards up there other than uh, the one in charge either are on the train or have gone back up the tunnel, uh, you know, up towards um, New London, and he's just left there because it's his office and he's just sort of in charge of it. He just lives there. He's got every, he's, maybe it's a cushy little place where he's got his screens, mm. he's got his. So what, while they're having their argument and everything's going on, we see a train come in, empty, and then because yeah, obviously I'm, I'm thinking this is King's Cross Station, not King's Cross Underground. Yeah. So a train pulls into King's Cross, you can't just pass through, can you? So it's pulling in empty, yeah. and then it gets loaded up with four or five prisoners in chains, yeah. um, and then leaves again. They watch all this go on, and then they could perhaps even watch a warden or two walk back from the train and follow them. Yeah, basically that's that's what I was. Yeah, and then they're um, I don't know. Like the wardens could just be talking about something or other, but they're not. At which point, Tom kills him, takes their guns, and now yeah, gosh, and now you... Connor and Leona have got guns, and we then get Leona set up to have her coming of age moment where she gets to be the one who. Poof, yeah, puts Captain Rowland. So that down. makes sense to me because then it's it's just a bit better than. As I say, the only part that really took me out of it was, oh, look, it's exactly a, the, the missing <laughs> clue we needed to tell us that this is precisely where to go, whereas just having the same normal process going on in the background, it's like the world is alive behind the scenes then. It's not like it's all based around the owner's life and so clues appear. It's just that other stuff was happening around her and she happens to have been in the right place near, the, you know, near where it happened or she heard it in the distance or something, you know. Um, right, my plan then. Um, taking that into account, I am going to pad these beats out now over the next few days. Each of those chapters is going to have a proper paragraph written about it. You, I mean, you can see yeah, on my notes. Quite a lot already. Yeah, there's yeah. it, basically a sentence or two for each chapter. I'm going to pad that out to a cha- uh, paragraph for each one, just to start to weave in some of the subplot bits. Like the, I mean, I've said stuff about Tom and his daughter and the mysteries around people keep getting killed, like his daughter, Leona's parents, now Connor's parents, weave in a little bit more about that, tie in a little bit about the relationship between Leona and Connor, um, pad that out to full, par- full full paragraphs for each chapter. I'm going to sling that over to you by the weekend for you to have a read through, yeah, and then we can cool. discuss that on here next week, and if we're happy with it, I'll get on with writing that. And um, I'm thinking we're looking at about 100,000 words for that as a book. Cause it's, um, yeah, it'd be good. The the twenty thousand words I wrote before got us roughly to the citizen centre by a slightly different route, but got us to that showdown at citizen centre where we find found out Ruby doesn't exist, and that took me twenty thousand words to get there, and that was twenty thousand words where I didn't really know the characters, didn't really know where the story was going. Yeah. So I reckon somewhere between eight and a hundred thousand words. So the biggest project I've ever written by a long long shot, and. Um, Hopefully get it written by the end of the summer holidays is the plan. Nice. That's what, a couple of months? Exactly. Over to you. Yeah. Um, right. So my plan, well, we discussed rewriting Mature and then and Left Behind. That was our kind of big plan. Um, which I abandoned. Yeah. <laughs> which, which, you know, rightfully abandoned. I think that's a good shout. Um, I have had trouble with Left Behind because, or for a different reason, um, I think the uh, Take Off Your Pants book was really useful in helping me think about why the characters are doing what they're doing and just kind of focusing on their drives and ending each chapter with a bit of a, a symbol crash, as she was calling it in the mm-hmm. book. Um, 
which we kind of did anyway because it was serial and yeah the episodic stuff yeah. that we would that was the one we because we'd already done episodic with mature and not really done it properly by then we knew how to do episodic yeah. stuff so we had proper cliffhangers at the end of each episode that's it. And I think the chapters generally did that as well. Mm. I mean, I need to properly read through it. I've only kind of flicked through it and I've tried to remind myself of the story. Now, the problem I've got is I can go two ways now. I can either just go through taking out the scenes that were a bit crummy and writing in new ones that kind of just fit it. And it's essentially the same story, but it's been edited and tidied up a bit and then get it properly edited by someone professional. Or I can crack it apart a little bit more. I mean, I kind of started making little notes uh, um, a couple of different times over the week. Emailed them to myself at work today. Um, in the current story, we've got Harry down as a teacher mm-hmm. um, who is generally quite happy with his life. So his general situation is pretty good. And then it just suddenly happens that the zombie apocalypse kind of kicks off and he just gets on with it. It's, it's almost like he gets swept away in it. I just put on here that he's begrudgingly looking at becoming a dad. Um, he's a bit bored with the monotony of his life, but at the same time, he's, he's sort of domesticated now. Um, in the background, there's Alfie, who's kind of a bit of a loose cannon, but he's also a teacher. And there's Charlie, who's just a complete damp squib and doesn't have anything going for him. So I kind of thought the current story is all set around that and it runs quite, you know, they're all quite true to that all the way through. Um, if I was to... If I was to redo it now, if I was starting this book from the beginning, the the big idea I'd had was trying to write that Harry was in a worse position, that this was more his story of going from this kind of man who's at rock bottom, you know, up and down, he's unemployed, he's been made redundant, um, suffering from severe depression and stress from the fact his life's fallen apart, that his wife tries to support him on her job, but she's... You know, in a, in a demanding role, I mean, we had her as a social worker in the story. He's wallowing all over pity and trying to sort of... He's not really trying to You're going to, to turn him into out. John Locke, who was obviously the best character in Lost for good reason, because he went through the same sort of arc. Didn't even think about that. That's interesting. But, yeah, he was generally... I mean, John Locke had a job in that. He was just paralysed, wasn't he? That he was, was miserable, issue. though. He wanted to yeah. kill himself. Well, he doesn't necessarily want to kill himself, but I could say that. Perhaps I could make it even more extreme and go completely to the edge. I quite but... like the idea of taking the teacher stuff out of it, because mm. if it was me doing it, I think the first, what we had before the first, the school is the, just, yeah, the yeah. first two episodes, I think it was, are fantastic. And other than weaving in a few character bits, like what you're talking about, I would leave the plot structure of them pretty much yeah. as they are. It all goes wrong. Once Furwinkle gets enrolled, because he's a ridiculous, unbelievable <laughs> character. <laughs> but that's and that's, it. He's a sitcom character mm. because we wrote it as a zomcom. It's implausible that they just an hour or so in go and chop someone's arm off. That yeah. just doesn't, that's another example of. It, it was zomcom. Yeah. It was funny. Yeah. It was it was written as six funny sitcom episodes of what would happen if there was a sitcom set in a zombie apocalypse, and. That's, there's reading no that, market for that yeah reading that over <laughs> weeks i guess you wouldn't question it so much because you'd think well right, yeah it's been three weeks since they've had this happen whereas when you're reading it as a story you kind of think oh this is the same night mm. <laughs> it's just gone and cut an arm off the other thing is with the way it is at the moment you have the first three quarters of the book take place over 12 hours mm. and, and then the last quarter is a week and yeah that at the time i never liked that mm. that never sat right with me and the sort of penultimate bit drags because it's really hard to have them what i really struggled with in writing it was as you say it had gone on really quick and then it got to the school and i couldn't just have it all erupt like that out of the mm. blue and kind of all go wrong i needed to have them really comfortable and happy like oh we've actually sorted this out and then bang it all goes wrong it feels but... like wherever they end up that should be the start of the second book rather than the first mm. book should be the story of them getting there yeah, wherever there is, sense. because the problem we had at the moment when that story was supposed to be hitting its climax and everything was supposed to be going wrong, we actually spent 10,000 words introducing all these new characters and having really mundane stuff like, what should we have for tea? Yeah. Who's it was nicked the arguing wine? over super <laughs> stuff, wasn't it? Yeah. And it, it just lost its way a little bit. And I would, if it was, I would just chop it off at, right, there's a zombie apocalypse. They've fled the house. Charlie's in the garden, maybe dead. Let's get out of here. And then start again from there and think, right, now we know who these characters are. Where do they really go? What would they really do? Wouldn't it have to be 
because what we ended up having originally was that they 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 panic and go home. And that's I think that's still that's it. reasonable. It's yeah. once they leave. I think we even when we wrote this, we had the big problem of once they left the next door neighbor's house. That was when it all went a bit kind of we couldn't decide on how to do it because we were going to have a kind of TV moment of the doors left open, but we couldn't write it. Um, and I had the out of body experience that you edited out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your solution was the Camera one that turned into a ghost. The sky. Oh god! But on um, TV, you could do. We were still thinking in terms of TV. No, we were. Weren't if it we? was on TV, you would have the camera sort of float up into the air and see the door was still open. And trying to write that from a from a first person <laughs> perspective, <laughs> it was just like he drifts away and left yeah. his body and noticed the door or something crazy. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, we both made a lot of weird introductions to that story, didn't we? We both put a little bit of weirdness in. Um, I kind of put that these drive for the first one the original was just to survive and look after mm. his wife and just avoid the fact that they, they looked like they'd killed someone yeah and that was kind of their big thing now i also like just one zombie in the yeah. first book i don't think you need extra zombies i think no. potentially this whole book could be there was the one zombie they've killed it what on earth are we going to do now? And you don't need more zombies until book two, But then it ends up being just them running around thinking they've killed someone and they're trying to avoid it mm. being an issue. And I think that becomes even harder to write and not try and make it... I mean, I put that... Um, basically, because if he's that low, what I kind of thought in a twisted way was he might see it as an opportunity <laughs> to <laughs> avoid a lot of problems. Um, like, he might just start off that he needs to deal with it. Um, do you want to put that on silent? It is on silent. I don't understand iPads because that is on silent. But you carry on. I'm going to turn that Yeah, so um, I kind of put that he wants to avoid kind of the issue of it looks like they've killed somebody. Um, but then he's he sees it's an opportunity to overcome his situation, overcome his depression. Um, but he basically, I, I decided that he would feel like he'd be, you know, he's the sort of person who would survive a zombie apocalypse. That He he wants to be like your Rick Grimes or anyone like that in any of the many, many, many um, you know, zombie programs and stories that exist. Because, I mean, everyone thinks they would survive in a zombie apocalypse. And I know I almost certainly wouldn't. But this guy is going to decide that if he's ever going to overcome his really poor situation, he needs to be the sort of person who's strong enough to survive a zombie apocalypse. Um, so in the original one, we only had an antagon- antagonist as like the zombies themselves, mm-hmm. and I kind of decided that the zombies are an obvious one, but there won't be that many of them. So I think we need more than one, but we still don't don't really we don't really need more than than a couple, I suppose, do we? Um, Surely the police become an antagonist if they think they've killed someone. Then the police. Uh, yeah, I suppose that could be a point. They could go that'd a... be the big thing they're afraid of. The zombies out of the way, and at least until they come across another zombie, the thing they're most afraid of is what if we get caught. So you've set me off on one now a little bit, where I'm thinking that they could, they could be on the run a little bit, or like they don't even know they're particularly on the run. They've just kind of got in the car and driven off with Charlie, and they're drunk driving, and they get arrested perhaps and stuck in a cell while Charlie's turning. And then that could just carry on from there, couldn't it? And just cause I was going to put that, as well as the police and the zombies, their own stupidity is kind of a big antagonist. Because <laughs> part of the story, the way I wanted to run it, was that you know Harry seems to think he'll be able to just become a survivor and redeem himself because that's what he wants to do and that's what he set himself against. But he's forgetting he's pathetic. He's forgetting his best friend is unreliable and hung up on his ex girlfriend who dumped him because he was a joke, you know, doing drugs and all sorts like that. Not anything hardcore, but he's been, you know, dependent on Bit of glue sniffing. <laughs> um, later on in the story, other survivors might be a problem. And what I kind of thought was once they have a bit of a, which this might have to be book two now thinking about it, because you've set me off on a bit of a, a, a new run in my head. <laughs> but I was thinking, like, I had some characters I wrote in late on in the book where we needed just extra people in the group. And I quite liked them when I was writing them. So I was going to say that when I, when I started writing um, Arthur, the old man in it, when I got to the end of that book and I started writing him in, the reason I'd started writing him was he, I was trying to write him as quite a, a suitable leader. Like he has all the skills, he's ex army or navy or whatever I told him everyone he was. And, you know, he'd worked in a pet store and knew, I don't know why, he, he, he knew how to hunt store. and all sorts of stuff. Like he'd run his own business. The sign of a true leader. <laughs> but the point was he, he'd done everything that you'd want him to do. He'd ran a business, he'd ran a family, he, 
you know, ran, I don't know, his own platoon. Yeah. And um, yes, he's like, I don't know, late 40s, early 50s or whatever, but he knows what he's doing and he's often right. And I wanted, even though everyone should be thinking, that's the guy we want to lead us, I want Harry to resent the fact that he's the guy. So Arthur's the antagonist. Arthur's one of the main antagonists in that he doesn't do anything wrong. He's just got a different, he, he just wants to keep everyone if safe. If he's going to be in the book, he needs to be in it much earlier. Yeah, that was Is the there thing. any reason why it has to be just the three people at the start? Could it not be a bigger party? If you want extra I think that would be harder for them to be drunk driving around town. Yeah, I suppose. But um, the other thing I wanted to question about this was point of view. And this is something that came up yeah. when we had Harry DeWolf on the show ages and ages ago, the editor man. Um, because we had the four point of views, I think, in this one. Yeah, we went, it went Harry, everywhere. Alfie, Charlie, and whatever Poppy. the wife's name was. Oh, Poppy Cox, I yeah. remember. <laughs> one of my proudest moments. <laughs> yeah. Um, Does that need a change if we're not going comedy anymore? Or do we just leave that as a subtle you. nod? <laughs> yeah, I'll see. Um, I liked that. Yeah. But um, it, there was no real reason to do that other than it made it easier to put across what Alfie was thinking and yeah. what Poppy was thinking because they're all in the same place pretty much all the time. So it should just be from Harry's point of view. It's Harry's story. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. It's Harry's, so, uh... And plus then you get to have, yeah, Alfie will go off on his own sometimes. But we don't need to know what he's doing. He can tell us when he gets back. There's, you know, there's, yeah. we don't need to go off and follow him. Then you take away your favourite moment when Alfie jumps off a roof. Yeah, because that Harry's is one not that's very him. hard. He to... can come back and say, "I just jumped off a roof." And <laughs> Alfie's the kind of character where Harry will just go, "Get lost! You didn't jump off a roof, and it's left there." We don't know if he jumped off a roof or not, but like he's going to say he did because that's, that's the, the, the kind thing, of person it, Alfie yeah, is. He's definitely the sort of person who would be telling you all these stories where you're not quite sure whether yeah. he's done it or not. I just jumped off a roof and fought a bear. <laughs> <laughs> he's got to decide which percent is, uh, yeah. is right. Um, See, the thing is as well, I I had a really good start that I'd written to the book two based on the end of book one where they were all kind of leaving in their different buses and I'd written a whole new you know, lead on from that where um you know, they've been driving for a while but they've they they're in trouble and they've got to turn around a bit and then they come across one of the other buses that they abandoned and that guy is you know, furious that he's been left. There's no reason why and, we can't still do that. We mm, can't we could make Right, we know where the start point is. We know yeah. it kicks off around a Game of Thrones board game. We know there's a zombie. We know Charlie's left left behind. Um, and we know the book ends with two groups leaving on minibuses. And then it's just working out what where goes on between. Doesn't, I mean, even if we I don't push to book three or something, what, the reason I was doing it like that, I mean, I even wrote, I don't think I wrote it on here, but I, I planned to, um, was that obviously part of Alfie's whole story is that he wants to get back with, you know, find his ex-girlfriend mm. and try and rekindle that sort of thing. A big plan there was that she was going to be part of another group that they'd meet in, you know, because they're heading towards the city. Um, but she'd already have a new partner who was just a knob. And Alfie, again, everyone just mm. hates him because he's a knob. But it just caused a bit more. I mean, that part of that was still the sitcom, you know. It, no, I like, but, I, I think if we're looking for realistic, believable characters there is not a chance in hell Alfie's not going looking for his girlfriend exactly and there's not a chance she's not with someone else if she's as good as he says she is exactly. there? But and he's obviously going to think the guy's a knob so I suppose that works I'm not going to make him a cheesy knob where it's just funny and lame but I just think that needs to be I mean his main story is trying to prove himself to her really isn't it I mean he the thing is that I worry a little bit as well is because it, it's all from Harry's point of view now means that Alfie's going to take a bit of a well, step back. But book then... one is from Harry's point of view. Who's to say book one might be Harry's story, book two is Alfie's story, book three is Poppy's story. You know, you could do it yeah, however. Book four sense. could be Alfie's girlfriend's story. And, and plus, the way of doing that is it Anyone means... Die, then. Yeah, mm. Harry doesn't have to live forever then because he might come round again for another book, book six, if he's still alive. Um, or he might die on the first page of book two. Um, there you go. We've had his story... <laughs> He's I got, think that'd be a bit extreme. I'm not yeah, depressed you, anymore. Yeah, Bang! You, you wouldn't do that, no. but it, it, it allows it allows you to still have the multiple points of view. But the big aim for me with him, I wrote it down somewhere. The wording, and I don't know if I've really. Asked, I, I thought of it while walking home one day, and uh, thought, oh, "Hang on a minute, that's where I need it to be." It was generally I can't find the exact wording, but I wanted him to realise by the end of book one that his depression has nothing to do with the fact that he got made redundant or you know that didn't cause any of the issues the situation he's in is made entirely by his mm. stupid decisions so he picked the job and then ended up redundant because of the you know position he put himself in 
he ended up getting arrested because he drunk drove. He ended up with this issue with his partner because he, whatever. Every you know, I'll be weaving things through, but it'll all be obvious to him by the end, and that's where he'll kind of yeah. get that moment of if I'm going to become the person I want to be, I need to just man up and realise that I'm. My this mind me. is currently running overdrive now at the prospect of different books from different mm. points of view because straight away they don't have to be people you've ever met. They don't have to take place in a particular order. Yeah, you could have, you have me f- killed and write it yourself. Yeah, well, you, well I could write a few mm. because, yeah, you could have the mind spaces, Yeah, you could it? have the initial story of yeah, we might have a three or four book series, which is the story of Harry and his gang. But there's no reason why, in a year's time, we couldn't write um, the story of a couple of people who were hanging out in Leicester when it all kicked off, or in five yeah. years' time, write the story of right, we're ten years into the zombie apocalypse now. We've got a group of people down in Bournemouth, and this is what they're getting <laughs> up to. <laughs> And straight away, and then and then it becomes more of, right, we need to really craft this world now. How does this world work? Because we've now got different people moving around in this world. And you don't have to do that in book one, because in book one, it's all taking place in one village. It's one small group of people in one village. And then it ends with Patient them. zero as well. <laughs> yeah, it ends with them leaving that village and going out into the rest of the world. And that rest of the world could be anything. Mm. And book two doesn't have to be anything to do with them. Book two could be something completely different. But, and then it allows the books to be read in different orders. And oh, I like cool. the idea. See, I was thinking just then, and I don't know if it would kill it in any way. Um, I've had that long standing comic book series that I wanted to write that we could set right at the end of the whole thing, like 10 years down the line. Kill you if you include that. Um, but it could be, couldn't it? It could be set like so far in the future that it doesn't affect any of the books, but explains the whole thing. And then I'm going to put in as the last chapter, and then Harry woke up from his dream and slumped <laughs> in the shower. Yeah, I could do that. <laughs> now, I need to get that done uh, as well. Actually, I've got so many projects. Do this um, one. Yeah, this one this needs is to the be one. done. This, by this time next week, I want story beats. I want you to spend 20 minutes at the start of this reading out your story beats for Left Behind. Yeah, they are. I mean, I, as I say, I started writing there. Um, you've kind of set me off on one a bit now, but no. I think good. looking at the take off your pants structure, we need to know about Harry. So we've got his floor. Mm-hmm. We know where he's going to be at the end of the book. We know what your goal is. Yeah. Um, now we need to just work out what takes place to take him from point A to point B. And it, it really comes down to, right, once the attack has happened and they leave, where do they go? Why do they go there? What happens while they're there? To um, Remember, we're constantly battering Harry down to make it look less and less likely that he's going to achieve his goal. He has to hit his massive low point about mm. three quarters through where he thinks, you know what, this is never going to happen. I give up. But then he has his big hero moment where he hulks up and shoots Captain Rowland in the face and says, hmm, not if you don't know we're coming. <laughs> Which is going to be on T-shirts when the movie of Stray is made. Is that going to be made? Is that going to be a line in every single thing we do now? <laughs> like that? <laughs> What's the matter? Never taken a shortcut before. Yeah. Um, like, the zombies are going to kill you. Look, not if they. Not you have the little. Me. You have teenage girls with the Hunger Games badges on, and they all want the divergent tattoos now. I want people walking around in T-shirts with Leona pointing a gun, saying, "Not if you don't know we're coming." Makes sense. Because she's going to be a badass. See, I'm, I'm thinking now. Uh, in my head it's playing out they once they've left next door they they head off get caught arrested in a cell the, my one worry with that is it's just setting off cliche alarm bells in my head well, and I don't arrested. know I don't know why I'm yeah. thinking there's a zombie apocalypse getting on and they're stuck in a cell and I don't I can't pick the story off the top of my head but my head's just going no you don't do that no that's too obvious it's too easy it's too I don't know it just doesn't I'll wait and see your beats. It might work brilliantly. Mm. But I was just thinking if it all kicks off in out? there, because then there's a drama of he turns while they're in there. They'll be in the cell. They have what, to so Charlie's out. there as well? Yeah. Okay. So he's turning in there. They have to get out, but then maybe the guy... Plus, obviously, if they're in there for a while, yeah. then that's pretty boring. <laughs> well, they won't be in there for cell. long, but you're right. Um, and I'm just thinking, like, then he'll go home thinking we've got to get out of here or whatever. That brings Poppy in a bit later than... Uh, maybe she's trying to ring. Maybe they have the one phone call Perhaps over she's the phone. Uh, trying to bail them out when Charlie turns, so maybe. she's already there. Yeah, and then I'm just thinking then they've got to kind of flee the town knowing that it's all going wrong. But, I don't know, perhaps that's when the forces come in or something. I don't know. I have to think about it. Mm-hmm. I'll write it mm-hmm. out. Um, this has gone on much longer than I expected it to. We did have an any other business section, but to be honest, I think we've both got so much to do. Mm. We can put that on the back burner. Have I talked you through? I've got a story I really want to start, and I, I, I don't know whether to talk 
We could talk, save it for another week if you want. But... Let's save it for another week because yeah. we're already pushing an hour. Yeah. Um, we've got other stuff we've got to get done tonight as well. The other one's um, burning my brain now. I want to write it. Well, I've got to get this done. <laughs> make some notes. Out. Next week's meeting, we'll have the Beats for Left Behind. Um, I'll have an update for what's going on with Stray, but there won't be much more than that. We'll we'll talk over our um, rough idea for It's Always Raining in Scunthorpe. <laughs> yeah, that's our working title. Yeah, our um, new sitcom idea. Um, which I have been reading how to write sitcoms for the BBC. No, so I've, okay. I'm researching the structures. I'm thinking that might not even be a book. They have their sitcom um, submissions open once a year. We've just missed it for this year. It closed in <sighs> April. But if we can get a proper pilot written by this time, by sort of January, February next year, ready for when they open that window again, send it in as a script. By January, Feb next year, we could. Well, is it got to be one episode? Or, yeah, you send yeah. the pilot script in. We could just write a stack of them. Well, there's no point if they're not commissioned. A stack of pilots, I meant. Oh, different yeah. shows, you know. Yeah. The Let's League. write some books first, eh? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so, and yeah, you can if we've got the time there, and you can talk about your burning idea, but I expect story beats for Left Behind first. Yeah, I might try and write story if beats you for don't, <laughs> If you don't have beats for Left Behind, any time you try and talk about anything else, I'm going to sit with my fingers in my ear going, nah, 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 until I've heard full beats for Left Behind. I was going to quote your book, but I can't remember the line. They won't know we're coming or something like that. Not if they don't know we're coming. See, I can see that when I first <laughs> wrote, flying I don't even know if that's going to be exactly what she says. But when I was sat there typing it out yesterday, the hairs on the back of my neck stood <laughs> up, and I thought, "That's the moment. That's when every teenage girl in the world falls in love with her. That's when they decide to make the movie. When that happens, makes sense. I like it. So um, this concludes our first official recorded story meeting for Steven Media. This will be in a museum one day. Yeah. Um, if you've watched it on YouTube, thank you very much. If you've listened on iTunes, thank you very much. And um, if you want to find out more, head over to kestevenmedia.com. Over there, you can actually find um, some freebies of the first episodes of all these books that we've been talking about. There's nothing about Stray. I've even taken the Wattpad thing down. But if you want to read the first episode of Original Left Behind for free, um, you can actually get it on com, as well as the first episode of Mature, the first Best Thing From book, and our short story, England United. So there's lots of reading material to yeah. get stuck into on there I as well. I guess Left Behind will stay pretty much the same. I'll edit it. I'll edit it book one and well, two. Well, you have to change but... what Harry does. and Yeah, Harry yeah, acts, yeah. Because at the moment, um, he's already pretty together. He's There's, yeah. there's no journey for him. What I moment. mean is, like, for those of you who've maybe read the first lot, when, it, when the time comes... You, it won't be t- ah I'm, I'm tra- talking behind. you out of reading it yeah, there. Left behind. well no I I would say don't read because yeah, read read the first episode get a feel for because I think the tone of it and the feel is quite good it loses its way a little bit further on and mm. um, we're going to take it off Amazon so you won't get the option to read the rest of it unless you do it really quickly um, but I think left behind as it currently is the best character for a story is Alfie because he's broken and has to fix himself. Mm. But it should be Harry's story, but he needs that journey to go on. And at the moment, he's already pretty close to perfect. <laughs> yeah, he's and, sorted, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to lead everyone. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we'll leave it there. Thank yeah, you very much for week. listening. Slash one.